Can you change the world through entrepreneurialism? In other words, can business be an instrument for social change? In his book, How to Change the World, David Bornstein profiles social entrepreneurs, women and men who are innovative, successful, grassroots individuals who created businesses that address a wide range of social and economic problems. As he puts it, social entrepreneurs are creative, driven, and adventurous. They embrace change, exploit new opportunities, and they think big. Social entrepreneurs can and do change their societies and the world, and in doing so, demonstrate that one person can make a difference. Madeline Shaw is one such person. She was concerned about the impact feminine hygiene products had on women, the environment, and not to be overlooked, the cost. Shaw and her business partner, Suzanne Siemens, created LunaPads, a company that provides better healthcare products for people and the planet. LunaPads are sold worldwide, and as a result, more than two million disposable pads and tampons are being diverted from landfills every month. To talk about social entrepreneurialism, LunaPads, and her latest social venture, Nestworks, we sat down with Madeline Shaw for a conversation that matters. Madeline Shaw, welcome to Conversations That Matter. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here, Stuart. You are, in some ways, a serial entrepreneur. Is that, would that be an accurate description? You've started a number of businesses, and every single one that you have started, you've done with a business component, and then there's a social component. Why is it so important for you to have the marriage of those two elements when you create a business? Yeah, um, I love that question. and. I would say uh, I would call myself a social entrepreneur for that reason and in fact I am these days uh, a serial social entrepreneur and I've started three different ventures and to me the marriage of business and social change is actually quite an elegant one like mm -hmm. it, it surprises some people because um, the things that I've undertaken in my career have a very definite goal of social and environmental impact um, that is often undertaken by charities, typically, or has been in the past. Mm -hmm. Or government agencies at sure. times. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. And I, and I guess, for me, I've got my own way of doing things. I love being an entrepreneur, and I love um, just giving consumers or giving people ways to affect social change through their everyday purchases of products and services. So allowing them to make a difference, it's kind of like voting with your dollars. Mm -hmm. And so it's just become my life practice for the last 24 years since I started my first company. And it's really what got me, wanting to change the world is actually what got me into business. And I've just, I love it. And there yeah. must have been a number of people who said, no, 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 you can do one, but you can't do the other. There are still people who say that, actually, or, or who find it confusing. Um, and I feel, you know, the, in a way, the division between for-profit and non-profit worlds is sort of a false one. And I think that if we really want to innovate in terms of how charities can be more self-sufficient and how businesses can be more humane and serving of the environment and social impact, it kind of makes sense to get in there and blur them a little bit. So mm -hmm. that's what I've been all about. But doesn't it make it a little bit challenging as far as finding like your financial model to support it? If you're saying, hmm, I've got this social component mm -hmm. that I need to address, and therefore it might make the product more expensive mm -hmm. or a little bit more challenging to put together, or a variety of other things, and then you say, and I want you to pay for it this way, and people go, well, no, I don't think so, because I can get it for a fraction of the cost over here. Yeah, maybe. Okay, so yeah. let's take it, let's get into an example here. So my first venture, well, it's really my second, it's called LunaPads, mm -hmm. and we specialize in natural feminine products, feminine hygiene, menstrual products, um, reusable alternatives for bladder leakage and menstrual needs. Okay, so those products up front cost more than a box of disposable products. Mm -hmm. But they're reusable over several years. So actually your long-term cost savings are quite advantageous. And you're also, there's a huge environmental uh, benefit to using the products. Mm -hmm. And they also tend to be less irritating than disposables. So people are already using products that they don't really love and that in fact are quite a bit more expensive. And so when we introduce them to an alternative, there's quite a bit of education involved in doing that. But mm -hmm. um, we have, Oh my goodness, it speaks for itself. Like um, we do business in 40 countries and we have a staff of 13 in East Vancouver working away right now. And 
Um, we wouldn't be there, like we wouldn't exist if there wasn't a certain segment of consumers who wanted those types of alternatives and those types of products. Okay. How many years have you been doing this now? Well, I, I started mm -hmm. developing LunaPads 24 years ago in 1993. So, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 1993, you start to introduce a, an environmentally aware mm -hmm. uh, menstrual product. Yeah. Uh, 24 years later, we can look back and say, well, you see, it worked. Yeah. But how challenging was it? Oh, hugely. Oh, my gosh. It's been, it's, it's been so much work, but it's always been enough reward financially and in terms of the experience to keep going like it really has always felt inspiring to me and uh, you know I mean in business past a certain point if things aren't gonna succeed financially you can't keep going like that's how mm -hmm. it works and maybe at that point you should go start a charity or something <laughs> but in the case of Lunapads we've always had um, customers that have supported us and people who've wanted to be on our team we've even had investors put money into our company and now, um, in the last few years, the whole conversation around natural menstrual products has become of age. I mean, it's, it's in national, it's on the cover of news, Newsweek, for goodness sake. And um, so in a way, I think we were a bit ahead of our time mm -hmm. in terms of pursuing it. But now reusables from reusable coffee mugs and reusable shopping bags are kind of normative in terms of consumer behavior. But we had to be part of shaping that. Now, because you are sustainable financially mm -hmm. because you've got this mm -hmm. model that, as you say, stretches out into 40 different countries, yeah. does that then allow you to accelerate the social component of what you're doing with Lunapads? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And thank you for asking because, um, so we've kind of got our Western consumer facing our website at lunapads.com. That's how we've done most of our business. Um, we got into addressing menstrual health needs in the global south in 2000. So the reality is for all too many girls and women and others who menstruate in poorer nations that they don't have access to any sort of products whatsoever to manage their menzies. And so mm -hmm. as a result, the girls will often stay home from school. And you know, so you don't want- So then they miss out on important education. Exactly. And, yeah. yeah, and actually spiral, right? You know, down to a really poor outcome for them as individuals, but also the loss for their community, their families. It really, these girls are the future, and educating them is what it's going to take to to get us all sort of elevated. Yeah, because we know that, as Aristotle pointed out, that if one person does not become fully realized as a human being, then there is something lost to us all. That's right. And, and so every person counts. That's right, yeah. and we're not, you know, until we're all free, none of us are really free. And, yeah. and so, yeah, so we took on this issue of addressing menstrual health in the Global South and have worked, oh, so many different projects, Stuart. I would, like, we've gone through about seven or eight different iterations, everything from straight up donating our products to people who need them, mm -hmm. through to mentoring the startup of other social enterprises and businesses located in places like Uganda. Um, we provide- Through Lunapads. Yeah. Wow, absolutely Isn't that amazing. It is amazing, and it defies traditional business wisdom. Like, why would you basically give away your business model for free to another, or your patterns, or your IP, or whatever, to another company um, in and the global an south? And your answer is because it feels great, and it, it <laughs> makes an impact. Like today, Afropads, which is this business, we first um, met the founders in 2008 when they, they, they approached us very transparently, and they said, we have some of your products. They were brought over by a woman uh, from Vancouver um, to give to the girls in these communities, and we would like to start a for-profit company essentially replicating these products in your business model here in Uganda. What do you think? And we just looked at my business partner, Suzanne, and I, we just looked at each other and we were like, yep, no problem. Like, we're, we don't do business there. It doesn't, it costs us nothing mm -hmm. um, to do it. And today, Afropads has 150 employees and has supplied over a million girls with their products. So that's what you get out of it. Wow. You get, you get that, knowing that you were in some small way responsible for that. And, and so where did it go from there? Because if you're moving into 40 different countries and mm -hmm. you're doing all of this uh, you know globally what was the next step in that um, well thanks for asking there too because <laughs> we were so impressed with what um, the Afropads team did that we actually became shareholders in their business so we purchased wow. shares in 2013 and I was super proud of it so it's this kind this thing that's just kind of gone around and around and around in terms of of impact and relationship and 
to me, it's like it, it literally cost us nothing, Stuart, nothing to do that, and was was just an act of generosity, and um, it's just part of our philosophy. We also believe that we're not in a win-lose kind of situation. So in other words, if you were to start, let's say you started your own natural menstrual product company, you know, I could get all worried about that and think, oh, you're, you know, you're being competitive with me, or I could have the philosophy that we're in a global marketplace mm -hmm. that we couldn't begin to fill the needs of even if we tried. Like, it's, it's just so big when I think about it. So I don't even, like, we've completely reframed ideas like competition and that sort of thing as well. Because one of the overarching uh, objectives of your company was to help to, uh, like, nurture the environment that is so important to us all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so the more people yeah. who are doing it, the better. Exactly. Right. So you're still achieving your outcome mm -hmm. or your desired outcome, which is to protect the planet. Yeah. But you're doing it by extension through other people who can then also benefit. Yeah. It's extraordinary, isn't it? It's just a different way of thinking about it. Like, I, I think um, it's kind of a kinder, gentler, saner version of an approach that has often been exploitative. Like, a lot of people say capitalism is bad, and that's that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I actually used to believe that when, as a university student, um, I started my career as a social change activist, um, mostly running anti-violence campaigns uh, at Queen's University, which were desperately needed. Um, and that introduced me to leadership, and now I'm losing my train of thought. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you had one, so at long. one time thought that capitalism was Oh yeah, was and bad. it was at that time I did yeah. think that, and mm -hmm. I was, I just, I thought it was something that was inherently broken. And, and I know there's lots of people out there that still believe that, but my feeling is it's such a pervasive and necessary, like we need to have some kind of economic Sustainability. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So how are we going to do that? You can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. My belief is that people need to get in there and lead with their values and start rethinking what what is the point of doing this? Is the point of doing this just for me to make a pile of money or is the point of doing this for us all to make the world a better place? If you can use your business to help mm -hmm. to improve the quality of life of the people around you and mm -hmm. then by extension around them and so on, mm -hmm. then you are having a very positive impact and you're staying alive, you're meeting your own needs. Exactly, and you're creating employment for others, and you're also not depending on a handout, essentially. So I'm not coming to you saying, you know, will you give me a donation? I'm coming to you and saying, I have this great product, would you like to buy it? Mm -hmm. And your answer can be yes or no, and I'll move on to the next person and so on. So that money comes back to the company when I do find you know, mm -hmm. someone who says yes. And then I'm creating jobs and supporting all of our products are made here in Vancouver, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's this kind of virtuous circle instead of just being a one-way transaction where I give you something and then you consume it and then off you go, and which can create a culture of dependency. This is our second break. Okay. We'll be back in a moment. So you have identified now another need. And you <laughs> it's as though <laughs> having changed the world to a certain extent mm -hmm. it, it with Luna Pads, you're now saying, well, there's another element that I want to change over here so that more women and in particular mothers mm -hmm. have the opportunity to do the same as you have. What is it that you're planning on doing now? Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm working on a project called Nestworks. And mm -hmm. Nestworks is, and it's not just for women and it's not just for parents, although mm -hmm. definitely focused on parents yes. um, as a primary user. And um, I want to make a place where people who are entrepreneurs can bring their children to work with them. So in other words, it's a partnership between a licensed daycare provider and a shared office space. And, and a few other bells and whistles in there, and soft goods maker space and R&D lab, for example, we can get into that as something secondary. But yeah, it just strikes me as grossly inefficient that we don't incorporate childcare more into our workplaces. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to make uh, like essentially a model of doing that. Right, well, and one of the reasons that we don't is that for a lot of small businesses, they just, they can't make it make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yep. I can't provide daycare services when I only have one employee that sure. has children. So, yep. th so then how do I do it? Or I'm just a one or two person operation. One of us has children, and the other one doesn't. Mm -hmm. How are we going to make that work? Mm -hmm. And 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 is this specifically what you're hoping to address, or is it beyond that? It's beyond that. Yeah. So, but it but it is absolutely like it, it's it. Um, it is that simple that there is a lack of, you know, um, individual small businesses, as you point out, they're not able to finance it. 
Um, but if you bring people together, as we're seeing, you know, in the co-housing movement, the sharing economy and things, mm -hmm. if you can um, aggregate needs, then you can create efficiencies and, um, and also opportunities for social innovation. Like, I wonder what would it be like to work as part of effectively an ecosystem of other small businesses where you're sharing information with these people, you're developing relationships with them. Um, you're bouncing ideas off them. Like, what what would come out of that beyond just you and your business and and your kid being next door? Like, what what are the opportunities for collaboration? That so, why happen? is it important that we do this? Like, who is it holding up right now? And and so, what's the cost to us as far as other people coming along and, and being entrepreneurs that make significant contributions. Absolutely. Um, I, I think there's a huge loss. Like the pattern that I see most typically is that you'll have a, a professional woman and she'll be working in the mainstream, you know, working world and she'll have a child and then she'll take maternity leave and then she'll go back, but it's not super comfortable. There's very little flexibility typically and mainstream jobs and, um, and she wants to be a mom and obviously her partner wants to support her in that and so on, but there's just so little flexibility to mm -hmm. really make it possible. Um, and then- Within well, a rigid uh, structure uh, Very of a rigid, company, yeah. super rigid. And um, and on top of that, there's very little childcare available in the first place. So if you're able to yeah, you know, problem. get on the yeah. waiting list by you know the time you even know you're pregnant and so on and, and push and push and push, like it really is. Somebody at the city of Vancouver the other day dis um, described the situation for childcare in Vancouver as a crisis. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was a big issue in the last election. It's no secret that that uh, as a standalone issue is a problem. Yeah. And so, I. I witness a lot of these women dropping out of the workforce um, and maybe pursuing certain projects that they've had on a part-time basis. Maybe they become consultants. Maybe they've always had an idea for a certain kind of product they wanted to develop. To mm -hmm. develop. And I call these businesses bonsai businesses. Bonsai? Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> well, if you think about a bonsai plant, it's constrained, right? Yes. Like it's, it's, you've got the whole tree in there, but the pot is really small and it's got little wires around it, so it's yeah. sort of being held back. And when I think about that in the case of a human being in Vancouver, if you are, let's say you're in your house and you've got a kid or two, you've rented out the basement suite to pay your mortgage, you don't have really anywhere physically to work. And so if you're the kind of person who's developing products, let's say you're a product designer and you want to be an entrepreneur, like where do you go to actually develop your products and develop your ideas, let alone be part of a community that could support you in being commercially successful in marketing them? It sounds impossible because I know, you know, when you have children and mm -hmm. the, the needs that they have that have to be met now, mm -hmm. how does that give you the creative space, the intellectual space, the, the time to think, to work something out? Yeah. It, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. So that's why bonsai, because I see these individuals mm -hmm. as sort of like they, they have constraints and whether it's their children or their space or, you know, whatever that is, I'd like to offer an opportunity for people like that to come to provide a licensed childcare opportunity for mm -hmm. them. So they, they, they bring their kids and they'd be well looked after professionally. And literally next door, ideally, would be a workplace where mm -hmm. they could rent a desk or they could rent an office or they could come and develop their products. And so there's this beautiful kind of efficiency that if you just want to go and have lunch with your kid mm -hmm. or check on them and see if they've got a cold or whatever, or just say hi, yeah. it's this completely feasible, completely acceptable practice to go and do that. Where are you at in bringing this idea to fruition? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a space yet, but I am very serious about this and I've been working on the business plan since November. I have a board of directors. I have a website at nestworks.space. <laughs> Um, we've got a survey I'll put up. that up there on the screen. Thank you very much. Okay. I would appreciate it. If you put all my URLs, <laughs> URLs up, I would love it. Um, uh, we've got a public engagement event for anyone who's interested in this idea to help us move it forward so we can better understand and quantify user needs on October the 24th. That's a Tuesday in the afternoon. So we're actually going to sit down and talk to people. Like this, It'll feel like a town hall meeting kind of thing because I need to understand how many other people are out there who are seeing this or, or feeling... Um, the pain, if you will, of uh, not having access to something like this. Uh -huh. and, but it's always a bit tricky when you're trying to introduce something into the marketplace that effectively doesn't exist because people can't, you know, they're just like, whoa, whoa, how, what's your precedent? How, how can you prove this? And right. Yeah. So and, and you already mentioned the cost of real estate in, in Vancouver, in yeah. the greater Vancouver area. 
I'm trying to think of, well, how many companies or individuals you mm -hmm. need to have to make this work, mm -hmm. and then how much space would you require? Mm -hmm. uh, what would it cost them? Uh, and <laughs> yeah, it's a bit tricky, but there, there are actually some interesting examples but it um, has in Europe. tremendous potential. I can see the potential. So I think the mm -hmm. argument is right what you said initially. It's like, what is, what is the mm -hmm. cost in terms of Vancouver's economic output of all these bond size? Like, what if those businesses could flourish? What if they started hiring people? Like, what would happen if you literally busted up the pot and planted them in an environment that was conducive to their success and so their So instead of growing like this, they go like that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I, and honestly, I've, I've spent my life making things in Vancouver, and it's been really hard. I used to be in the fashion industry and sort of watched a lot of that manufacturing move offshore. Um, we work with what's left. I think it's true of many other sectors where we're, you know, this real estate frenzy has kind of edged out these um, small run producers manufacturing, whether it's wood products or furniture or so on. Um, but meanwhile, there's a culture of design is, you know, look at the new Emily Carr's, you know, right. beautiful university. Where are the graduates going to go? Who are the ones who want to be entrepreneurs? Who are the ones who want to commercialize their designs instead of going and working for someone else? I would like Nestworks to also be a place for those people to come. I think that it's a fantastic mm -hmm. idea, and I think that you need to have uh, some pretty uh, far-sighted uh, thinkers mm -hmm. to be able to get behind you. Uh, and I hope that they watch this program and want to get behind you because you need money to help get that going. I do, and I and I mean we, we're currently seeking out partnerships with the city and with the Vancouver Economic Commission, with um, various institutions who I think would benefit. The Business Development Bank of Canada would be an example. Um, I think we need to prove the model on a smaller scale and just mm -hmm. show people what's possible, and then grow it. Like, wouldn't it be wonderful? It'll be kind of like an economic or monetized community center is sort of how I'm imagining it. Well, yeah, you create a little economic zone. Mm -hmm. Because I, I can see that a lot of these companies would then start trading off, services off between one another. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's a fascinating idea. Thank you. I wish you all luck in the world. Thank Thanks you for Stuart. coming in and Thank doing you. this. Total yeah. pleasure.